You know, Zozo, I've been really pondering about how James left off his last letter from Designland. I really want to know what he meant by diving into, quote, the best part of game design, creating emotion with math. Dang, what's the probability of that timing, huh? Oh, 100% because it's all pre-written. Oh my god, they're seeing behind the veil. Cut to the intro, cut to the intro! Thanks so much to NordVPN for helping to keep us safe on the internet. To take control of your internet security with a two-year plan on a huge discount, use code EXTRACREDITSVPN at nordvpn.com slash extracreditsvpn. So how do we as game designers create emotion with math? I think that's a pretty cool question. And to figure out the answer, let's start by examining a common example, a game with a romantic relationship mechanic in it that also includes the standard trope of gift giving. How might we make this actually feel meaningful for the player? Starting with the basics, you'll probably have a how much the person likes you stat in this type of game's code. Let's call that stat affinity. So your basic equation for gift giving is something like affinity plus gift like value. Now, in a lot of games, gift like value is static. So if a character likes, say, for instance, flowers, every time you give them a flower, they get 50 more affinity towards you. And I'm not even kidding when I say this is actually the complete system in way too many games. But as I think you can gather, this equation treats the character like an object to be one, not a person with their own needs and wants, taking away from the immersion of treating that character as someone you care about. And I think we can do better. So let's dive in to the gift-like value stat and see if we can make it function a bit more robustly. Instead of saying gift-like value rows equals 50, let's say we made it gift-like value rows equals 50 minus 10 times gifted rows. Because giving the same gift over and over again is not only boring, it shows that you're not really thinking about the person. You just have some idea that you're supposed to give this to them as a gift, and now we've represented that by putting in diminishing returns on giving this gift. This minor tweak moves the needle of interaction with that character just a bit more towards something that could mirror this experience IRL. But you know, on that note, you know what's really creepy and not at all okay in real life? Someone who you don't really know or may not even like in the slightest giving you a romantic gift. So let's make it. If affinity is greater than 30, gift like rows equals 50 minus 10 times gifted rows. Else, gift like value rows equals negative 50. By putting those conditionals in there, we can make the interaction between the player and the character feel more real, and the character on the receiving end less like a trophy. But you know what? Let's add some more layers in there. Say the game is actually about two high school sweethearts going off to college and trying to maintain a long-distance relationship over freshman year. Being away from each other is hard, and living two separate lives that you can't share is a struggle. So then maybe we have something in there like turn start affinity equals affinity minus one. So now you're fighting against time. You'll have to work to keep the relationship that was once so easy. And maybe we have something like this in there too. Turn start affinity equals affinity minus one. Meet someone new equal rand 1 to 100. If meet someone new greater than 75, new romance. Because you know, there is always the chance that the person you're so far away from meets someone new. Though that math doesn't sound exactly right. I mean, if you still really, really love someone, you are less likely to find a new relationship. You know, probably. So instead, let's make it. Turn start. Affinity equals affinity minus one. Meet someone new equal rand zero to 100 minus affinity. If meet someone new greater than 75, new romance. Now we've just built in that finding a new relationship is less likely when you're still passionate about the old one by making the random roll for finding someone new dependent on your current affinity score. And I'm not saying that you should do this, but if you wanted to, per se, make your game feel really tragic, if you wanted to make it about slowly losing someone, about someone slowly slipping away, then you simply balance the game, such as it's incredibly difficult or impossible, for all of the nice gestures, all the Zoom calls from far away, all of the digital roses, to keep up with the decay in affinity score, and all of the random events that can subtract from it. So now, we've moved a game from your standard relationship as prize mechanic into something talking about, and with the ability to convey what it feels like to, day by day, watch someone you love drift away from you. We've built tragedy with math. And since math is how we model the world in games, it's of course also how we can make statements about how we see the world. Let's say you're making a grand strategy game, and every once in a while your population has to vote on a policy. And if it doesn't pass, then you don't get to do it. Well, 
if 10 multiplied by benefits from policy plus propaganda score is greater than 500, vote for, else vote against, is a very different game and says very different things then. If benefits from policy plus 10 times propaganda score is greater than 500, vote for, else vote against. The former creates a game where people are part of a rational, sane populace, capable of making their own decisions to benefit them. But the latter builds an experience where that population is more akin to a frothing mob, swayed by propaganda, more so than their own interests. In the first game, the math would push you to play as a benevolent leader, trying to create policies that benefit the greatest number of your people. Whereas in the second game, the math would drive you more towards playing a tyrant, trying to control your population through manipulation and media. And while the first one is pretty run-of-the-mill, the second one definitely sets up a specific emotional reaction from your player. Because if you're the type of person that always tries to do the good run-through the first time you play a game, I think it's safe to say you're going to feel a little bit frustrated. You'll be tearing your hair out saying, Why do these people vote against their best interests? And if you're the type of player that min-maxes, you're going to realize what's going on pretty quick and then feel sleazier and sleazier as you play into it. Heck, let's even take it a step further with a new example. Let's say, instead of using a standard tech research equation in your game, like research per turn equals number of labs times research rate, you choose to make it research per turn equals number of labs minus number of religious sites times research rate. <laughs> oh boy, howdy have you just made a statement. Now you're saying something with your math, and that's a powerful thing. Though one quick word of caution, especially when your game is set in the real world. Sometimes, it's easy to subtly influence players into thinking the things that you are portraying is actually how the world is, rather than that you're exploring an idea about the world or making a statement about it. Of course, that shouldn't stop you, but it just may mean you need to be a little careful. But still, don't be scared to make your math have meaning. Whenever you're designing systems or even implementing content, try thinking of your equations as statements about the experience. Each part of your equation is a phrase, and each phrase says something about the experience it creates. Don't think of your equations just in terms of a system in a game, but imagine you're living that experience. Then you can look at what's missing and what needs to be said and go from there. If you can do that, you won't just be creating gameplay. You'll be creating an emotional landscape for your players to play in through your math. And with that, dearest Matthew, I leave you for now with just one more example. It's from the game I'm currently working on. It's less an equation than a long-term if statement, but it was the first moment that really got me invested in this trip into design land. So here you go. If character has dog, and character has died, and Rand 1 to 100 is greater than 50, and character has relationship love or relationship friend, randomly selected relationship love or relationship friend gains trait dog name. Spawn event, take care of dog name while I'm gone. Design boldly, dear friends. James Portnow. <laughs> Damn. Uh, I actually didn't know uh, math could make me tear up like that. Damn good example, man. And if you'd like a good and far less sad example of the best tool to keep you safe on the internet, you need to look no further than NordVPN. I nailed that transition. Do not at me. If you're like us and spend a ton of time on the internet and also utilize a bunch of unsecured public Wi-Fi spots in your travels, you know how dangerous digital life can be. Which is why we're big fans of NordVPN, because it's an all-in-one solution for your online security needs and gives you privacy on the go. Nord hides your IP securely, utilizes next-generation encryption, and has a ton of servers worldwide so you can connect all of your devices with one click and be browsing securely in seconds. Oh, and these servers are blazing fast, meaning we're not telling you that you could say take a virtual vacation to a place's IP that had a more impressive Netflix library than your current country, but we're also not not telling you you could do that, so uh, yeah. Also, with NordVPN's strict no logs policy, they don't track your usage on their end either, which could be very useful if you don't want anyone finding out about all of the totally normal and mundane websites you visit. So to protect your data that matters and get the best price on online security, all you gotta do is use the code ExtraCreditsVPN at the link below. You'll get a huge discount on a two-year plan with a 30-day money-back guarantee. And you'll also receive four extra months of next-generation protection absolutely free. Then, not only will you never be scared about your internet security again, but you'll also be helping to financially protect this channel with your support. Thank you so much, and happy browsing! You know who's just the best? Ahmed Ziad Turk, Angelo Valenciana, Arcalite Games, Casey Muscha, Dominic Valenciana, Joseph Lame, and Skylar Holmes. Thanks so much for your support, all.